press recording. All right. So this is my great uh, pleasure to interview Yuhua Zhu. So she was, uh, so I've been, uh, I've known Yuhua from seven years. And um, so um, since uh, her PhD in uh, Wisconsin, uh, so she finished her PhD in 2019 uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And then she came to Stanford to do a postdoc uh, for three years now. And currently she's a, uh, a long-term visit, visitor at the Simon Institute at Berkeley, uh, California. Um, and um, Yuhua works um, on kinetic question in her PhD thesis and uncertain kinetic question and uncertainty quantification. Um, now she's working on machine learning and, and um, optimization um, and reinforcement learning. So those are all very hot topic. Uh, sh today she's gonna talk about one of her um, research direction, which is also, uh, which is hot, which is about focal prong equation and machine learning. So please, you want. Yeah, thank you, um, Bing, for the nice introduction and the invitation. And thank you, everyone, for coming. So today I'm going to talk about focal plank equation and machine learning. So first, I'll give you some brief introduction about the, the physical background for the focal plank equation. And so let's look at this ODE. Here, x, you can view it as a particle's position. So the right-hand side is the velocity. And the gradient flow is one example. Here, this f is the landscape of this loss function. And now the particle move along with the direction of negative gradient f. Um, what if we have some stochastic involved in the system? Mm -hmm. Then this x becomes a stochastic process. Mm -hmm. How to describe this stochastic process? Here comes the focal Planck equation. So the solution of this focal Planck equation describes the probability distribution of this x at time t. And the right hand side, we have a drift term mu is the negative of the velocity and the diffusion term is one half sigma square. We can also involve the acceleration and then we have the system of ODE the second equation is simply Newton's second law. Here we assume the mass is equal to one, then the acceleration is equal force. Um, again, what if we involve some stochastic into the system? Then we have um, the system of stochastic differential equation. For example, the particles in plasma is one example. Here, the forcing term is the electric field plus some friction term between particles. But at the same time, all the particles are also doing Brownian motion at the same time. So how we describe um, the movement of these particles? we use this so-called velocity of focal Planck equation. The solution here is describing the possibility of finding the particle at position x with velocity v at time t. And the right-hand side, we call it the focal Planck operator. Again, the drift term is negative of the forcing term and the diffusion term is one half sigma square. So how does that relate it to machine learning problem? A lot of machine learning problems end up solving an optimization problem. For example, they are solving, in this example, they're solving a loss function, which is an empirical mean of a data set of size n. And if we apply stochastic gradient descent, what they do is they randomly select a subset of data of size m. So this m is much less than much smaller than the total number of data n. And they, the parameter is updated uh, according to the empirical mean of the gradient um, for this subset of data. And this gamma is the learning rate. One way to uh, model this gradient is using the expectation of this gradient, which is the gradient of the total loss plus on a normal distribution with a variance that is pro proportional to uh, learning rate over the batch size M. Um, and here, sigma square is the variance of the uh, total data set. 
And if we let the learning rate gamma go to zero, then the process can be approximated by a stochastic differential equation. And the PDF of the stochastic process can be described by this Volker-Planck equation. So in general, um, this Volker-Planck equation always involves two terms, drift term and diffusion term. And when we describe, uh, we can always describe the PDF of a stochastic algorithm using this Volker-Planck equation. And this drifted term is basically driving the x, the parameter, to the minimum x star. And for gradient-based method, which is commonly used in machine learning algorithm, um, the drift term is usually negative gradient loss function. And also there are gradient-free method. Gradient-free method is basically let x go to a place x star tilde, which has a smaller value, smaller value on the loss function than x. We will talk about this gradient-free method later. And the sigma, the diffusion term, is basically a noise term. Let the parameter explore the landscape to avoid being trapped into a local middle. And why we want to use the focal planck equation to analyze the stochastic algorithms. So I think there are at least two advantages. One, in the discrete level, we, we can only analyze the algorithm in expectation or in worst case scenario. However, in the continuous level, because this focal planck equation, the solution directly describes the PDF of the algorithm evolution. So it's easier to analyze the performance in distribution sense when we use the focal planck equation. Another advantage is that the focal planck equation gives a unified tre treatment to a family of algorithms. So that's why I relate the focal planck equation to the machine learning. And today I'm going to talk about three separate projects um, where I use focal planck equation either explain some phenomenon in the machine learning algorithm or use the focal planck equation to find some property of this algorithm. Okay, so let's see the first example. So the first example is we, we are going to talk, uh, compare two algorithms, resampling and reweighting in correcting sampling bias. So first, let me explain what is sampling bias. Sampling bias, so first we assume in a population, we have two groups, yellow dot and red dot. So the um, population ratio of these two group, it's A1 and A2. So in this case, we have more population on the yellow dot, less population on the red dot. And the first group and corresponding to the value function V1. The second group corresponding to the value function V2. And the total loss function is um, a weighted sum of two loss. And the weight is the population distribution A1 and A2. And somehow when we collect data, this is data we collected. Um, the sample distribution F1 and F2 to these two groups is significantly different from the population distribution. Then we call it sampling bias. Um, it's a very common problem uh, when, we, when we collect data, when we training the model. So for example, uh, when we do survey, if we do not correct the sampling bias, then the survey will lead to a result that is bad for the underrepresented group. And also there's another um, very famous example in the artificial intelligence, which is the so-called pause model. Um, this is the algorithm that can automatically um, transfer unclear picture to a clear picture. However, when people input a blur picture of Obama, they somehow output a white male's picture. So the reason behind this is because when they train this pulse uh, model, they use a lot of biased sampling. So that's why the uh, model they trained from bias sampling is a biased model. So we, we see that correct bias sampling is a very important issue in machine learning. 
So there are two, um, there are a lot of methods to correct the sample bias, and the two of them specifically are very similar to, to each other. So one is called reweighting. The idea is simple. You just put more weight to the underrepresented group and put less weight to the overrepresented group. Specifically, we multiply a weight AI over FI to the sample from group I. AI is population distribution, FI is the sample distribution. Then we get an unbiased sample, an unbiased total loss. For the sampling, what we do is we upsample the minority group or undersample the majority group. So basically here, uh, we only have four samples for the yellow uh, for the yellow group. So what we do is we um, sample multiple times for the yellow group, but we sample less times for the red group so that we can correct the sample bias. So these two methods, both in expectation, they have the same expectation. So in deterministic algorithm, both converge to similar solutions. But when we do stochastic gradient algorithms, the behavior of these two is very different. Let's see three examples. Um, one is classification problem. And the underlying distribution is same for two group, but the first group has much less sample than the second group. If we do nothing, this baseline, we have this arrow. If we do weighting, we can reduce the arrow a little bit, but for resampling, we can further reduce the arrow. And these two examples, we have two, three cases for the sampling. Um, from black to gray to light gray, um, the sample is more and more biased. Um, and we can see for the weighting, the performance become worse and worse when the sampling this distribution is more and more biased. But for the resampling case, for these two cases, they are consistently um, outperforms the reweighting and they are more stable. Um, you can see the resampling almost don't, uh, won't be affected by the uh, different uh, sample bias. Okay, um, so why is that? The key is the difference of the variance. So the variance of the weighting, we can see it's heavily depending on the sampling distribution, F1 and F2. Um, but the variance of the resampling case is independent of F1 and F2. So this is why the resampling case behave very stable, even if you change the sampling distribution, F1 and F2. But the weighting will depending heavily on the F1 and F2. And more specifically, why resampling outperforms weighting? I will use the stationary solution of Foucault Planck equation to explain this phenomenon. So let's see this uh, simplified example. We have a piecewise linear loss function. We have two groups. Um, so the first group um, has the um, minimum at negative one. The second group has the minimum at positive one. And um, we, we let the uh, second group has more population weight. So the global minimum is on the second group, which is on positive one. But the sampling distribution the first group is much more than the second group. So we have a big sample bias here. And let's look at um, what resampling and the weighting do. So as I said before, um, both uh, methods had the same expectation. So the parameter is updated um, according to the derivative of the loss function, V, V prime. Here, they are the same at, at the expectation. The difference is the variance term, so the noise term. The resampling has a noise that is in independent of the sampling distribution, and the reweighting is depending on the sampling distribution, F1 and F2. And let the uh, learning rate eta go to zero. 
uh, we can describe the update of theta by this focal Planck equation, where we have the same drift term, but different diffusion term. And if we calculate the stationary distribution of this equation, so basically let the right-hand side equal zero, uh, we will have a stationary solution for this equation. And we compare the stationary solution at theta one, the local minimum, and theta two, the global minimum. The global minimum, minimum is the minimum that we want to convert to. Um, for the resampling case, we will get a ratio that is independent of the sampling distribution. And the reweighting, which is heavily depending on F1 and F2. And if we plug in the specific ratio we have, we can see that the resampling, because the local minimum is larger than the global minimum. So distance is positive and this term is negative. So the total ratio is less than one, which means that for the resampling case, we have more possibility to converge to theta two than converge to theta one, which is what we want because theta two is the global minimum because we have more weight on the second group. However, for the reweighting case, um, since F1 is larger than F2, much larger than F2, so here, this constant before the exponential term is larger than one. Again, the, because of this sampling bias, and the exponential power also flipped the sign. So the exponential term is also larger than one. So that's why for the reweighting case, we actually have more possibility to converge to theta one instead of theta two, which is the local minimum. Um, because we have more sampling on the first group. But we, what we want is we want to converge to the um, theta two, which has more population sample, we have more population uh, distribution. So that's why the weighting in this case is worse than the resampling. I have a, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so you, when, when theta is negative and theta is positive, uh, the diffusion term is discontinuous, right? Yes. So, so, so do you expect some uh, irregular behavior for the focal Planck equation? Um, yes. So actually, on um, the distribution, the, um, the final distribution, there is no discontinuity. But the equation itself, you are correct. There is a discontinuity at theta equals zero but it doesn't affect the stationary distribution because you have uh, you have a, a constant before the exponential term which give you a continuous uh, distribution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay Thank you. thanks for your question yes um so uh, we summarize the stationary distribution in this theory um, we can see that the stationary distribution for weighting is heavily depending on the um, sampling distribution, while the stationary distribution for sampling is independent of F1 and F2 and only depending on A1 and A2. And let's look at how is this um, stationary distribution changes as the F1 and F2 changes. Um, so we plot this stationary solution in this picture for the reweighting case, and we change and the underlying um, population distribution is 0.4 to 0.6. And we change the sampling distribution F1 from 0.4 to 1. So basically, as the F1 grows, um, the sampling become more and more biased. And we can see at the beginning, the station distribution concentrated on the global minimum, which is what we want. However, as F1 grows, it becomes more and more concentrated on the global minimum, concentrated on the minimum that comes from the more sampled group. Okay, so, um, so this shows that the, the stationary distribution of the weighting will become, um, will have more possibility to, to uh, 
convert to the local minimum as the sample become more and more biased. For the resampling, however, it doesn't affect it by the F1. It's always, the stationary distribution always looks like this, concentrating on the global minimum. Um, and in the discrete side, this discretized version, that is, if we actually run the SGD with reweighting and resampling with a small learning rate, um, 0.12 or 0.13, we can see in these two examples, um, for the reweighting, even if we start from the global minimum at one, eventually it will jump to the local minimum and stabilize at the local minimum. The reason is exactly because the stationary solution for the weighting in this case, it has more possibility on the local minimum negative one. For the resampling case, we don't have this um, phenomenon happens. It's always stable at the global minimum one. We can um, generalize this theory to piecewise convex function. So each group, um, their loss function is a convex function plus some order epsilon noise. And all this convex function has the same minimum at different place, at different local minimums. So whether um, this minimum, so whether the total loss is smaller, it's really depending on the weight. If this group has more weight, then this group has a lower value on the loss function. And if we calculated the stationary solution for this uh, loss function, we will see that for the resampling, it will have more possibility to converge to theta p if the piece group has more weight, which is what we want. Um, however, for the reweighting, it's really depending on the sampling distribution, f p and f q. And we can also generalize to multidimensional case. For the multidimensional piecewise linear case, we have a similar result. Uh, the resampling um, distribution, the ratio of two minimum is independent of the sampling distribution, while the reweighting heavily depending on the sampling distribution. So this is uh, we use the stationary solution of focal Planck equation to explain why resampling always outperforms weighting when correcting the sampling bias. Before we move on to the next project, is there any questions? Um, so I have a question. Uh, so here mm -hmm. you, you use a, a Brownian motion, right? So what mm -hmm. if you have so, something else like uh, Shantanovic noise? Very good question. So we only discussed the, the Brownian motion case, but you are correct. So uh, when you model the SGD, um, there's also some other cases that you model the noise by some other noises. Yeah. Um, in that case, um, it's actually much harder to yeah. analyze because um, the corresponding PDE is is not going to be focal Planck equation because focal Planck equation is only for the Brownian motion noise. Mm. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the next project is uh, about reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning got a lot of attention of this alpha goal. Um, and it also has other applications, for example, in robot robotics, autonomous driving, so the reinforcement learning is really about just about Markov decision process, which is a discretized stochastic process modeling decision making. It has four important, four basic elements in the MDP. The first is state space. Here we assume the state space is a compact set. And the second is action space. So for example, we start at state S0 and we apply an action A0, and we will arrive at a place S1, which depending on this transition matrix. Um, so this transition matrix tells us the probability distribution of your next state, if given the current state and the current action. For example, in this case, we, we arrive at state S1, and we will have a corresponding immediate reward R, 
which depending on the state and action. So this is the four basic elements or MDP. And another important concept is called policy, which is which specifies the action at state S. So given a policy pi, uh, the MDP will generate a trajectory, um, will tell you the state S the action, uh, the state S the action A and reward R at time T. So how to um, evaluate whether this policy is good or not? We evaluate by the value function Q. So the value function Q um, under policy pi is basically a discounted cumulative reward. So here we have a discount factor gamma, which is a constant between zero and one. So basically it discounted all the future rewards. Um, and, uh, and we have an expectation here. This expectation is over all possible trajectories starting from this A0 and A0. And the value function is larger, which means the policy is better. So the goal of reinforcement learning is uh, basically uh, yes, the reward is a function of S and A or S, and because there is a, so above you wrote that the reward is a function of S and A, right? But below you wrote it. Oh, like... yes, right. It's a typo here. So it should be A0. Okay. Yes, A1. Yes, okay. right. Okay. So there is actually another version of the word depending on the current state and next state. Mm -hmm. But um, currently I'm using only this. Okay, yes. Thanks for correcting that. Okay. So the goal of reinforcement learning is trying to maximize the value function over all possible pi. Um, so we want to find this optimal uh, value function. And this optimal value function has very good property. It's the fixed point of this optimal Bellman operator. This Bellman operator looks like this. If it affects on the value function Q, it is equal to the, the expectation of the reward um, plus um, the gamma, which is this count factor, which is constant between one uh, between zero to one, times an, an expectation on the next state, conditioning on the current state and current action. And we also have a maximum of this Q over all actions. So this is a um, Bellman operator and the um, Q star is a fixed point of this Bellman operator. And one way to solve this Q star is to parameterize this Q by a parameter theta and solve this minimization problem. So we basically want to minimize Q minus T star Q squared so that the minimum of this object function is exactly the fixed point Q star. Okay, so let's summarize this objective function, this optimization problem in an abstract form. So uh, what we want to solve is basically um, um, a this minimization problem. We want to minimize this object function over the parameter theta. At the same time, this object function also depending on the current state and next state because this, op, um, this um, Bellman operator is, has a conditional expectation on the next state and the conditional current state. And we are going to solve this optimization problem using a trajectory generated from this underlying transition dynamics. Okay, um, so how to solve this problem? So if we already know the uh, transition, transition dynamics of uh, already know this operator T. What we can do is we insert this operator into the object function to replace this ST plus one by the transition of ST. Then we can transfer this object function to an objective function that only depending on the current state ST. Then we update the parameter theta by the gradient of this object function which is basically the uh, expectation on the current state GST times gradient GST. 
So the unbiased gradient for this true gradient is simply GST times gradient GST at the current state ST. And we have a trajectory ST, then we can simply update our theta by this trajectory we are given. I have a question. There's, so so mm. when you take the gradient, there's a number two missing, right? Or am I wrong? I'm sorry, what? what, what, what can you repeat? We have a number two missing, or uh, uh, is it fine? I mean, because this is square, so when you take the derivative, there should mm. be a number two, no? Uh, oh, yes, we miss a number two here, but yes, so yes. the true gradient should be two times this. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm. you're, you're correct. Thanks for correcting me. So it should be two times, two times. Yes, yes. Um, so what's the problem? So the problem happens when this transition dynamics is unknown. Mm -hmm. So when this operator T is not explicit known and we are only given a trajectory as T, mm -hmm. what can we do? So first we cannot um, derive a op objective function that is only depending as T. What we do is we directly taking gradient for this uh, object function. We still ha have a t here, a two here should be, okay. And the gradient should be, um, since we have the, the object function is square of expectation. So the gradient is two independent expectation. So the gradient here is expectation of f times expectation of gradient f. So this two expectation is independent, okay. Then the unbiased gradient should also be two independent transition from the current state to the next state. So this is the key. And why this will cause us a problem? Because um, now in order to solve this, uh, um, using stochastic gradient descent to solve, this object, uh, to solve this optimization problem, we need two independent transition from ST to ST plus one. The first transition can be easily obtained from the trajectory. However, the second is usually unavailable because in this trajectory, we are in a continuous state space. It's hard for this, for this trajectory to go back directly to the same spot as T. So it's hard for you to find another trajectory that is starting from ST, go to another second, go to an, the next state, a second sample. So that's why this is so-called a double sampling problem in the reinforcement learning. And one method in the literature to uh, approximate this unbiased gradient is they use the exactly same sample for the next state. However, you can see the expectation of this term is because this two term is correlated with each other. So the expectation is not the two independent expectation that we want. Okay, so we propose a new method. Um, so first, um, this is the uh, unbiased gradient that we want in the reinforcement learning setting. And we assumed the underlying transition is a discretized SDE with a small time step epsilon and a drift term alpha. And what we do is we move one step forward this is a step that we can easily um, coming from the trajectory. And we move one step forward. This two step both can coming from the trajectory. And, and what we do is we borrow the future step, this step to the current state and approximate the second sample by the current state plus the future step. Why this is going to be a good approximation because when the um, alpha is uh, a smooth function, then, and the time step epsilon is small, then this term is going to be very similar to this term. So that's why this is going to be a good approximation when this drift term is smooth. Besides, this term, this future step is much uncorrelated to this, this step. So that's why uh, we call it borrowing from the future. What we really mean is we borrow this extra randomness from the future. Mm -hmm. And when this drift turn is smooth, this is also going to be a good approximation for the next state. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so this is the borrowing from the future algorithm. Um, let, let me first show you an example, compare our algorithm to other algorithms. Um, so this is a benchmark problem in the reinforcement learning. So uh, what we, the action for this problem is basically you move this block to left or right to avoid this stick to falling down. And we compare our method with the sample cloning method we mentioned before. We just copy the first sample to the sem second sample. And also we compare our method to another commonly used method called prime dual method, uh, which um, they transfer this minimization problem to a minimax problem. However, this problem is not going to be stable when this maximum is also over a non-concave function. We can see in this experiment, the y-axis is the value function. So we want to maximize the value function. Um, and the primal dual method, which is the blue line, it doesn't converge at all. The sample cloning is the red line. It converges slower. And the, um, our method is borrowing from the future. We have two versions. We borrow one future step and borrow two future steps. Both are uh, converge faster than sample cloning. Besides, it converts to a value function that is has a larger value than the the value function that sample cloning converts to. Okay, so now I will explain why our method is much better than the sample cloning method. So here is the let me summarize the um, problem. We want to minimize. Uh, an expectation of f square, which this f square, we call it Bellman residual, depending on the current state and next state. And the um, this transition from the current state to the next state is described by a discretized uh, SDE with a small uh, step size epsilon. And this is not given. This is not exact. Explicit given, this is only an underlying transition dynamics. Okay, and um, we assume that the state space and action space can be embedded into a compact set. And we assume the learning rate eta uh, for the gradient descent method is small. These two are standard assumptions. So uh, this is a more important assumption that we use. Um, we assumed underlying dynamics change slowly with respect to actions. Basically, we want the underlying transition matrix, the drift term, um, the variation of the drift term on the action space is upper bounded by a constant C. So under this assumption, the, we calculating, we first compare um, the difference of the, our method BFF and the unbiased gradient. Um, for one step, the expectation of these two is order f times epsilon. Here, f coming from this object function, the Bellman residual, and epsilon is a time step epsilon. So uh, you can imagine when the algorithm evolves, our object function continue to decreasing. So here, this f is actually helping this epsilon to become smaller and smaller because as the algorithm evolves, this f is also going to be more and more approaching zero. Um, so this is difference between our, our proposed method with the unbiased gradient. And the sample cloning method, their difference to the unbiased gradient is only all the epsilon. There is no this extra f term. And this is only the arrow for one step. What about how about the asymptotic error? So that's why that's how the Fokker Planck equation evolves and um, comes in. So for the Fokker Planck equation, then by the gradient, we have the drift turn, which is the gradient of the object function. And the BFF, it's a little bit biased. The bias is order f times epsilon. And sample cloning is only order epsilon. And the distance of our method to the unbiased SGD, we call it D. And the sample cloning and unbiased SGD, the difference we call it D tilde. So the D, the difference 
is exponentially decay and stabilize at a point of order epsilon times square root of expectation of f square star. This, this red term is the smallest Bellman residual that unbiased SGD can achieve. But for the sample cloning, it will stabilize at an arrow of order epsilon, which is much larger than this term because this term is usually is, is very small. So this is why our method is performs much better than the sample cloning method stereotically. We explain this by the focal Planck equation. So this is for the second project. So before we move on to the third one, is there any questions? Yes. So so you suppose this underlying dynamics, right? Mm. So um so what if it doesn't follow this? Uh, I mean, mm. SD, uh, plus one and SD doesn't follow these underlying mm. dynamics? Yeah, it's a very good question. So we actually try um, the, um, when the underlying distribution not following this uh, discretized SDE, we try, but it still works when the transition is kind of smooth. Yes, so even if you cannot, we, we use this only because we, can only prove the theoretical result on this result, but the algorithm itself works when the transition is smooth. I see. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so the last project is about a gradient-free method. And we use the focal Planck equation to prove why this gradient-free method is guaranteed to converge to the global minimum. Um, so first, um, this is the setting. We want to find the global minimum of a loss function. So um, there are a lot of uh, examples in physics or chemistry that we want to find the global minimum. For example, the ground state of quantum antibody problem. Um, and why we want a down gradient method. So first, the two reasons is obvious. When the gradient is hard to com compute or the objective function is not smooth, then it's better to have a non-gradient method. Um, and the third reason is when there is a local, flat local minimum. So for this flat local minimum, we can see the gradient in this whole region is very small because it's a very flat minimum. So when you use a gradient-based method, because all this gradient is very small, so it's hard for you to jump out of this valley to go to the global minimum. So that's why, um, we want a non-gradient method, which will be less affected by the geometry of the loss function. Mm -hmm. And there's also this called data privacy problem. So um, this paper in last year, which they uh, give some examples, when you share your gradient, the attackers can use this gradient to trace back to your data. So when you use gradient, to update your model, it's possible that you are also sharing your data set. So um, if you're using a non-gradient based method, it's possible that you can avoid this privacy problem. Okay, so this is the model we proposed. So first we generate N particles on the region, on the, uh, on the domain. And each particle, we let them move towards this X bar star. So what is this X bar star? X bar star is a weighted average of all the particles position. And we give them a weight. This weight is, um, is um, this weight is bigger when this loss function's value is smaller. So basically we give more weight to the particle that has less loss function value. Okay, so um, this is the model for the drift term. For the diffusion term, um, we let it also proportional to the distance of xj to x bar star. And we call it a component-wise geomet ge geometric Brownian motion. If we compare it to another model that is proposed um, in 2017, what, where they use the uh, noise turn with isotropic noise. So basically they use the, um, um, the distance um, 
of xj to x bar star, which is the same at all dimension. Here, in our example, in our model, it, it's, it is different in all dimension. Um, so in the high dimensional case, our model is much better than this model um, because our model is independent of dimensionality. So why it's independent of dimensionality? Let me explain it in a simplified model. Um, when this, um, here we assume this um, x bar star is just a constant. Then we calculate um, the um, function, the stochastic process x, the distance from x to the a, the, the global minimum we want to convert to. And we will see that it's proportional to the total, for each dimension i, it's proportional to the total distance. And if we use the component wise noise, for each dimension i, it only proportional to the distance at that dimension. That's the difference. So when you summation over all dimension i, you will have a term for the isotropic noise. This noise term will times d, dimension d. In our case, it won't time dimension d. It will just become sigma square. So uh, we want this x to converge to a. We need this variance to decay to zero. That's, um, that's, that need the co constant before this term to be less than zero, which give us a, a condition for this x to converge to a, which is two lambda need to be larger than d times sigma square. In our case, we only need two lambda to larger than sigma square, which is a condition that independent of dimensionality. Um, we can also um, prove the uh, more complicated case uh, what we can prove is the following. When the number of particle m goes to infinity, this system of differential equation will convert to its mean field limit. And this mean field limit, this x star is basically the expectation of the weighted sum uh, over a normalized term. And here is our component wise noise. And the PDF of this uh, mean field limit is a focal Planck equation. Okay. And for this focal Planck equation, we can prove the following. Here is some main assumptions. We first need to assume the loss function, the minimum of the loss function is larger than zero. And we have assumption on the second derivative of the loss function, which we need the second derivative to be bounded. And we assume that the variance of the particle x is v, we call it v. And this is the um, exponential, the weight, the weight of the function is m. And we have um, some conditions and um, assumptions on the lambda and the sigma and the initial uh, variance and initial weight. So under these two assumptions, on those parameters, we can have the following result. We can prove that the variance is exponentially decay. So basically the particle will concentrate on one point. And that one point is x tilde. And that x tilde will be very close to the global minimum Lm with an arrow depending on the dimension over the beta. Beta is the weight that we put on the exponential power. So this theory basically tells, tells us that under some assumption on the lambda, sigma, and initial variance and initial weight, we, all, all the particle is guaranteed to converge to this x tilde, which is very close to the global minimum, as long as we let the beta large enough. So this is theoretical result we prove for this algorithm. And here is some result. Um, we can see that uh, when using the isotropic noise, um, first let's see the loss function. The loss function has a global minimum at zero. All the local minimum is very close to zero. It's a very non-convex loss function. And we are going to do it in the 20 dimension. This is picture in one dimension.
Um, before, when we used isotropic noise, um, what we what they have is the success rate of finding the global minimum is from 34% to 62%, depending on how many particles you use. When you use more particles, then you have more success rate to finding the global minimum. And when we use a component-wide noise, we can see that even with the smallest number of particles, 50 particles, we almost have 100% success rate to finding the global minimum. So that's why um, in high dimensional optimization problem, this component wise Brownian motion actually helps a lot to find the global minimum. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. When I look at that figure in mm -hmm. another way of uh, seeing uh, physical phenomena or wave phenomena, I see two, two length scales. There you have a high oscillations and a slow modulation. Mm. Is, could could there be also like a multiple scale approach that can be um, thought about in, in, in cases like these? Uh, what do you mean scale approach? Yeah, so uh, suppose that the, uh, the um, I call the uh, horizontal axis X. Mm. So this looks like a, a periodic uh, thing, uh, cosine mm -hmm. of X and then- uh, yes with a modulation, a function of, let's say, epsilon x, which is a small parameter. Mm. So there is a, you know, mm. a local, a highly local variation, and then there is a slow modulation. Mm. Mm. Yes, right. So in, sometimes in doing asymptotics in, in other uh, areas of physics and ma mathematics, uh, mm. you do this, what it's called the multiple scale approach. And I wonder whether there is an, uh, an equivalent oh. way to see this. I see what you mean. So basically, we kind of um, have one particle to go as the x square, and another particle do the oscillation. I yeah, see exactly. And there are two distinct um, scales, uh, and then there you can use a multiple scale analogy. Uh, I see. I see. I see. Yes, it's, I, I'm it's, just wondering. It's not. It's yes. just the, what I saw there is. When I see pictures like this, I immediately think of yes. two time scales or two space scales phenomena. Yes, in other areas scale. of physics. Yeah, it's it's actually very insightful observation. Um, we can definitely use multi scale method if we know the underlying structure. If it looks like this, yes. But if we don't know the underlying structure, right. that's a problem. Yes. Sure. So this and this algorithm is basically is blinded to the structure. Any loss function, you can apply to it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. So um, that's all for my talk. So this is the uh, three papers uh, that is related to my talk. Okay. Thank you all. for the uh, a very beautiful talk. Uh, are there any? So we have to. <laughs> Are there any questions in the audience? Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. Um, so it looked like in the last slide that you were showing, there was an optimal number of particles um, that would give you a better accuracy. So when you're going from 50 to 100, um, you're getting a better success rate, but then from 100 to 200, it's mm -hmm. dropping a little bit. Could mm -hmm. you talk about maybe, have you looked into this, this optimal number of particles or could you talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit, what's happening? Oh, yeah, so this is actually a just a, as a oscillation because of noise. It's, it's not because the 100 is an optimal particle. In general, you put more and more particle, it's always getting better accu accuracy. So this is just because um, the oscillation. Um, and one thing that caused this, um, for this specific example, 100 particle is probably a little bit better than 200 particles is because the noise is a little bit too big for 200. Um, but okay. in general, yes, in general, when, for example, you increase the dimension from 20 to 40, I guess the 20, 200 particle would be better than 100. Mm, okay, mm. and I see. So it gets, I mean, but it gets worse as you move the the optimal point. So as you're moving from x star is to one, then the 200 is even worse, and then as x star goes to two, it's even worse again. But you're saying that it's just it's just an optimal, or not? I'm I'm using the word optimal 
in case that you maybe thought about that or there uh -huh. was an optimal number of particles. Yeah. But um, it just seems, so you're saying it scales with the dimension. So, but mm -hmm. in general, using more particles would give you a better success rate. Yes, in general. Yes, more particles okay. give you better success. So in this case, basically, and the particle larger than 50, it's, it's all good. Um, so the difference is just kind of like oscillation. Yes. Um, okay, thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Stephen. It's a very nice question. Yes. Question, uh, practical question. How long, you know, the time of computations, how much, what is the complexity and the time it takes to uh, get to the... Yes. It's a very good question. So actually, I don't have the time to talk about this, but we actually have a simplified um, um, numerical scheme, which basically, um, I'm sorry, so it's a skipped algorithm. Um, so when we actually doing the algorithm, we don't and update all the particles at each step. We only update a subset of the particles. Yes, so the total uh, computational cost is not as much as 200 times the each step. It's actually, for, for example, in this example, we only update 100 particles at each step. Yes, and for this case, it's only 50 particles. This is only 40. Mm. So the computational cost is, um, not that big. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, so how 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 many? Uh, uh, so how which which is the number m that you choose in this random? Uh, it's like random batch method, right? Mm, yes, it's it's called a random batch method. Yes. Um. So in this example, for um for n equal fifty, we actually choose m equals forty. N equal one hundred, we choose m equals I think seventy. And n equal two hundred, we choose m equal one hundred. Um, so, yes. so, so maybe why Stephen saw this? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, because you choose m to right. one, which is half of the two hundred. So, so maybe this is why this is bad. This is right. uh, more than um, than uh, seventy and one hundred. Yes, yeah, yes. Using seventy percent sample size for the one hundred and fifty. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this is also one reason. I, I, I skipped that because it's not related to the focal Planck equation. So, but yes, the underlying, there is some contribution to that noise. Mm. Mm. And I have a, a question. So, so the, uh, the first uh, topic you have reweighting and resampling. Mm. So, so reweighting is of some, someone else and resampling is yours, right? Oh. Uh, no, reweighting and resampling both are coming from the literature. So both are commonly used in the literature. It's I, I'm just using the uh, the focal plan equation to explain why resampling is better than reweighting. So it's it's ha it has been observed in the literature, but haven't been explained mathematically. Mm. The users or, or the ones who are building schemes believe you now that they, they, which one they should use? And so I, I will recommend them to use the resampling because it's more stable. Okay. Mm -hmm. I hope they listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people are already using resampling. Yes. Yes, in the literature, but they just don't know why resampling is better. Mm. Are there any other questions? If not, uh, let thanks the speaker again and thank thank you you for a beautiful talk. Thank you, thank you for the nice thank you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good uh, night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>